Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. This is not a video for new DMs. It is a video for new players or potential players. Welcome to Dungeons and Dragons. You're watching this video because, well, probably you're watching because you're a subscriber of mine, in which case, hello. But I hope you're watching because a friend of yours invited you to play D&D and you're sort of maybe interested, but you're not entirely sure what it is you're signing up for. By the end of this video, you will have a clear understanding, a less vague understanding. You probably won't be more confused. There are things I enjoy as much as D&D or more, but they involve hand-eye coordination or biology. I think D&D is the most fun you can have with your brain, but there's a lot of assumptions and traditions built into it that aren't written down anywhere. Let's talk about them. Before we start, I want to say this may be a long video, but you don't need to watch any of it. There was no YouTube or indeed internet when I started. When I started, if you saw someone playing D&D, you probably had no idea what they were doing. It looks incredibly weird, but they were obviously having fun. If you asked, what are you all doing? The canonical answer was, grab a seat, here's a character sheet. It was pointless to try to explain it to somebody. Explanations are boring says the dude who's about to spend half an hour explaining it to you. Much easier to just sit down and play. However weird the game seems, you will pick it up as you go. So by all means, just sit down and play. But having introduced the game to a few dozen people now, here are some of the things I've noticed that we who play all take for granted, but that aren't really written down anywhere. How long will it take? This is the question I get the most when I ask friends at work who've never played before if they wanna try it. It's the first question they ask, so it's the first thing we're gonna cover. I think the typical D&D session lasts somewhere around three hours, sometimes less, sometimes more, but when that session is over, the expectation is you're gonna get together again, maybe next week, and pick up where you left off. D&D is like television. This episode might be great. Don't you wanna know what happens next episode? So when someone invites you to play, they're probably hoping you take to it like a hobby the way they do. But it's perfectly reasonable to say, sure, I'll give it a shot and play one session and then say, thanks, that was fun and be done. Just talk to the folks who invited you. Say, I do want to try it, but I don't necessarily want to sign up for a whole new hobby yet. They will understand. What do you need? Well, nothing, really. You can just show up with your beautiful self and say, okay, what do I do? Your friends will supply the dice and pencil and paper and probably a copy of this, the player's handbook. There's no point buying all this if you don't know whether you like the game yet. But if you like it and you decide to keep playing, you are sort of obligated to get your own dice and rulebook. Don't just mooch off other players for weeks, it's rude. They spent money so they would have dice and rulebooks. It behooves you to do the same. It's a sign of respect. It shows you're serious about it. Make no mistake, D&D is fun, but it's the kind of fun people get really serious about. Perfectly natural. Choosing a character. Probably the first thing you'll do when you sit down to play is create a character. Your character is a combination of race, which maybe makes more sense to think of as species, and class, like elf ranger, or human fighter, or dwarf barbarian. There is no real way as a new player to know exactly what every class does. A lot of the terms and options won't make sense to you at first, and trying to read it all before you make a decision is basically impossible. So I recommend just looking at the art in the player's handbook and picking a race class combination that looks cool. Nothing wrong with that. Once you know your race and class, you pick a background that describes what did you do before you were an adventurer? Like before Bilbo was a thief, he was, Actually, I think that's a bad example. I have no idea what, do hobbits even have jobs? Are they just living in some kind of post-scarcity utopia? Anyway, your background gives you some gear and some money and some opportunity to describe your character's personality. Race, class, background. There's tons more, but that's the basics. The campaign. Your DM, probably the person who invited you to play, has built or bought and customized a world, like their own version of Middle-earth or Westeros. And in that world, they are running a campaign. That's what it's called, a series of adventures. Their campaign is necessarily personal and idiosyncratic. It might be a gritty street level urban game set in a fantasy city, or it might be about knights and noblemen. It might be set on the frontier or in the middle of the wilderness. Each DM's campaign is unique, no two are exactly alike, and a DM might over the course of their life run several campaigns, each different from the other. Inviting somebody to play D&D is like inviting them to watch TV. Until you know which show you're going to watch, you have no idea what you're getting into. So ask your DM what kind of show they're running. What kind of game is it? What does the DM expect from their players? These are simple questions, but the answers will have a huge impact on your idea for your character. Your DM's world might not have dwarves in it. It might not have humans. That would be weird, but it's their world. Expect your DM's world to be unique. Don't assume everything you read in the player's handbook will exist in that world. It might, but maybe not. Or maybe it'll exist in a different way. 
Sometimes new players get an idea for a character stuck in their head and refuse to budge. And when someone says, but does that character make any sense in this world? They start with the answer, yes, and then work backward to try to find a way to shoehorn it in. When a player does this, it means they're gonna have a bad time and the DM is gonna have a bad time. Your favorite character from anime or superhero comics or Warhammer 40K probably won't make any sense in a D&D game. So think about the fantasy stuff you're familiar with. Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, Warcraft and then think about your DM's world and what they expect. I guarantee you whatever arbitrary idiosyncratic limits your DM has placed on their world, there are lots of different characters you could make in there that you would enjoy playing. If you have a weird idea for a character, just do some work to make it fit in your DM's world. If you take the DM's world seriously, and they can tell you're taking it seriously, they will probably let you play something weird. You just gotta meet each other halfway. Building your character. There's a lot of numbers in D&D, but really not that much math, and almost all of that is just adding one number to another, so don't freak out. A lot of character sheets look really intimidating, but like 90% of this is just showing your work. Once you're done making your character, you only use a handful of these numbers. The rest are just there in case your DM asks, wait a minute, how are you getting plus nine to hit? You can look at the sheet and break it down. You start by randomly generating numbers that describe what your character is good at and how you're different from other characters. Traditionally, this is done at least in front of the DM and often also in front of the other players. And yeah, that's because you could just cheat if everybody did it on their own. But it's also just a lot of fun to all roll characters together and sort of feel how you're gonna be a party together. Talk about what you're each thinking about playing, a human monk, a dwarven cleric. The dice determine how strong you are, how smart, how feeble, how clumsy. Those are your stats. Your race gives you some abilities, like dwarves spend all their time underground and so they can see in the dark. And each species in D&D has different modifiers to their stats, like dwarves are hardier than humans, elves are more nimble. Your class, a fighter, wizard, whatever, gives you a bunch of cool abilities and you get more every time you level up. That's about 90% of your character. If you're an elven ranger, you're like 10% elf, 90% ranger. As you play, your character will grow and change over time, learning new cool abilities, finding awesome new magic items that give you cool powers. You're probably gonna start at first level, and here's something they don't tell you. In the current edition of the game, a first or second level character is basically a peasant who put down the plow and picked up a sword or learned how to cast to spell. Third level is where you get a lot of your iconic abilities, and so a lot of DMs start there for that reason. It means you begin the game already a hero. Starting at first level means you're not very good at what you do yet, and you may die easily. Depending on the kind of game your DM runs, life may be short. Death is possible, and unless you're very high level, it's something you do not come back from. If your character dies, that sucks, you will hate it, but about 20 minutes later you'll be looking forward to your next character. That's how it works. If your character dies, you just roll a new one. Your DM may have their own house rules for creating a character, I do, but I wanna emphasize your character is not your character sheet. Your character is this person that exists in the imaginary world. Your character sheet is an imperfect translation of that character into the rules of D&D. So you may have an idea of, for instance, this very strong, lightly armored warrior with a great two-handed sword, fantastic, classic character, and you may look at the classes and think, oh, barbarian, perfect. Well, maybe, maybe not. You may discover the barbarian's abilities are not really what you wanted. You can be a very strong, lightly armored, great sword wielding hero lots of ways. A thief, a fighter, a ranger, or some combination thereof. Your friends may say, no, no, do it this way. Screw them, they don't have to play your character, you do. The party. It's your character, but some consideration must be paid to the other people at the table. You're sharing your time with them, and that means you're entering into a kind of social contract. On their side, they agreed not to micromanage you and let you play the character the way you want. On your side of that contract, you agree not to be an annoying shit. It's easy to make a character you might like playing, but that would just annoy the crap out of everyone else at the table. It's your character, but you're all sitting around the same table, so you have to sort of meet each other halfway. Think of it this way, there are lots of different characters you would enjoy playing. Which, among those, is the best for this group and the world you'll be adventuring in? Some players believe in the idea of a balanced party, a fighter, a cleric, a thief, a wizard, but that idea only exists in their heads. It's not only possible to run an Overwatch team made exclusively of junk rats or Winstons, it could actually be a lot of fun. So if you like the idea of playing in a balanced party, by all means, ask the other players what they're playing and think about what would fit in. But you are not obligated to do so, and if others make you feel like you have to, they are being wang rods. Tell them I said so. I personally let my players tweak their characters in any way they want, including changing class in the middle of an adventure, though not in the middle of a session, that's crazy, as long as it seems like that will get them closer to what they wanted to play in the first place. 
I'll even let players throw out ideas and completely rework a character. Why not? Sometimes you get frustrated because you have this idea, but you can't get the rules to cooperate. So try different rules, use a different class. You can mix class levels to get closer to your idea of what would fit your character. Maybe you start off as a first level fighter, and then when you've adventured enough, you level up and take a level of thief or ranger. Now your character sheet says you are fighter one, ranger one, but that's not how your character thinks. Classes don't exist in the world, only on your character sheet. Role playing. The basic rinse and repeat of D&D is as follows. The DM describes the scenario, the scene in front of you. You are free to ask questions during this period. You are even free to interrupt and declare your character's action, though I do not recommend doing that until you have a sense for the flow of things. Once the DM is done describing the scenario, they'll say, what do you do, or some variation thereof. As long as you are describing what your character does, you're role playing. That's it. It doesn't have to be any more complex than that. The DM says, you roll into town. He describes the town. He asks what you're going to do. You say, I'm going to check out the inn and see if we can get a place for the night. That was it. You just role played. Some players like speaking in character. When your character walks into the inn, you might say, okay, I'm going to ask the innkeeper how much a room for the night costs. That's perfectly fine. It's fine to say I when you mean your character. Everyone does it. It's not weird. It's normal. We will know from context when you mean I the player and I my character. But some players might say, I approach the innkeeper and say, greetings fellow, we have traveled far and need rest. That isn't better than what you did, it's just different. It's a style of play. It's fun, especially once you get over the weirdness of sitting around talking in silly voices but it's not required. Don't be surprised if your DM tries to coax you into speaking in character. Feel free to give it a try, but if it feels weird, if you're not comfortable doing it, don't. The goal is to have fun. If you don't find that fun, don't do it. There are some players who feel it is virtuous to play in character, that everyone should do it. If you play long enough, eventually you will meet someone who thinks you can only have fun if you play the way they play. But this is nonsense. As long as you're not being annoying and wasting the other player's time, if you're having fun, then you've won. That's it. What happens first? Well, the DM will probably start by describing the current situation your characters find themselves in. If it's the first session of the game, you might all meet in a tavern. If you're joining in the middle of an adventure, your character might be held captive in the next room, and you have to wait a little while before the players get there and discover you. What happened to your character before the first session is up to you. Well, and the DM, I suppose. Some players like inventing a backstory for their character or talking to the other players about how they all know each other. But sometimes you don't have answers to these questions or it doesn't even occur to you to ask. That's fine. Like in the movies, they always show Conan as a boy. They show his origin story. Not in the books. In the books, we meet him as an adult. We have no idea what happened to him before the book started. And it's amazing. It's okay not to know these things or figure them out as you play. It's also okay to talk to the other players and maybe concoct a story about how you know each other. Maybe the DM is planning on the first session being the story of how you met. Back in the 70s, games sometimes started with the heroes literally standing outside the dungeon. That's where the action was. Why beat around the bush? All of these are fine. There isn't a right way to do it. I think there's a natural tendency for players to wonder, hey, how do we all know each other? That's fine. Go ahead and explore that. But if the other players say, I don't know, we'll figure it out as we go. That's okay, too. What can I do? The DM asks, what do you do? And you sit there stunned. You don't know what your character does. You don't know what they can do. What are your options? Well, because D&D has this weird thing, the dungeon master who is a person with ideally a brain, you can try whatever you want. That's the DM's job, interpreting your actions through the lens of the rules, plausibility, probability, and the world all this takes place in. Because there's this person adjudicating your actions, you are free to try whatever, within reason. Unlike any other game you've played, you have limitless options, because the DM can use their imagination and maybe some die rolls to determine the outcome to anything. Playing D&D for the first time, it's typical, it's normal to feel intimidated when it's your turn, or when the DM asks, what do you do? Relax. Eventually, it'll become second nature. First of all, unless the DM is talking specifically to you, feel free to sit back and watch the other players for a while. If someone says, okay, we're going to leave town and head through the forest toward the abandoned mine. If you keep your mouth shut, it's assumed you're okay with it. The maxim is quitaca consentire. The maxim of the law is silence gives consent. If therefore you wish to construe what my silence betokened, you must construe that I consented, not that I denied. Is that in fact what the world construes from it? Do you pretend that is what you wish the world to construe from it? The world must construe according to its wits. This court must construe according to the law.
Good dialogue. If things get thorny in the mine and you say, wait, I didn't agree to go, I want to be back at the inn, your DM may take it easy on you because it's your first time, but they may not, because that would require winding the story back much farther than is reasonable. In combat, D&D becomes a lot more bounded. You can move and attack, basically, or attack and move, and there are clear rules for both. But outside of combat, it's up to you to figure out what you want to do. That freedom can be paralyzing, but it's also what makes D&D amazing in a way a board game or a card game or video game can never be. I ran for a group of all new players and they tried to infiltrate a watchtower overrun with goblins in the woods. They knew the goblins were in there, but they didn't want to just break down the door alerting every goblin in the place. They wanted to sneak in and surprise the goblins. So they decided to scout around the outside of the tower, moving stealthily. They saw the top of the tower had collapsed. That was a way in. They could climb the tower and enter the hole in the top and the goblins wouldn't know. Then they could start picking off the goblins inside one at a time until the goblins realized what was happening. Just as they were formulating this plan, a good one and one I, the DM, had nothing to do with, they saw a guard standing in the hole in the wall at the top of the tower. The hole they intended to enter through. Now what? How to get up there without alerting the guard? They could shoot the goblin from where they were, but what if they missed? Or what if the arrow didn't kill the goblin outright? Then the goblin would sound the alarm and they'd lose the element of surprise. One of the players, Robbie, said, wait a minute, we can do whatever we want. Yes, I said, I could see the light going on. Well, my ranger can shoot an arrow and if I hit it says I can move the target five feet in any direction. Very useful tactically. Could I, could I shoot the goblin and if I hit him, move him five feet this way so he falls out of the tower? You can try, I said. He rolled, he hit, and I described as the arrow slammed into the goblin's shoulder, spinning him around and causing him to lose his balance and fall backward down to the ground. With a muffled thunk, the goblin hits the ground, dead from the arrow and the fall. To those players, that was an eye-opening moment. It was clear to them I had no idea they might try that. All I did was use the rules and some common sense to determine what happened when Robbie hit. It was easy. Robbie and the other players suddenly felt free to do what they wanted. It was a really simple thing, but that's the juice of D&D. It's your character. If it's reasonable, give it a shot. See what happens. Maybe the dice will go against you. That's part of the game. If you succeeded at everything you attempted, there wouldn't be much drama. Splitting the party. But what if you don't want to go to the Goblin Tower or the mine? Look, you and your friends are there to have fun and go on an adventure together. That means some compromises must be made. Compromise is virtuous, so don't be too prickly when it comes to your character's motivations. Why are we going to the mine? I don't want to go to the mine. I want to go to the tomb. I mean, this is a group activity, and with that, you get everything that happens when people get together. Things won't always go your way. Make your case, explain your thinking and your character's motivation, but be prepared to lose gracefully. Sometimes we need to grease the wheels of social interaction. If you constantly feel on the outside, not listened to, well, maybe this isn't the right group. That has to be a possibility. You are in charge of your character, what your character wants and does, how they react, but you are not in charge of the group. The group is like a raft floating down a river. You can do things to affect the path of the raft, but the forces determining where you end up are greater than any single person. The story. So you're playing your character in this adventure and it seems like the DM has it all planned out. Well, probably not. Probably the DM just has a framework, an outline of the basic structure who the bad guys are, and what they want, but the DM does not know what you are going to do, and since they don't know what you're going to do, they don't know what happens next. Once you describe your actions, then the DM decides what happens next based on their idea of what's reasonable, what's plausible, what's dramatic, what's fair. That intersection between what the DM had planned and how you react to it is where the game happens. It is D&D. So don't attribute too much intent on the part of the DM. Don't try to think about what the DM intended you to do because they probably didn't know. They only knew what the bad guy's plan was and how they were gonna go about it. And then a hook or two for how to get you into conflict with them. Then the DM sits back and watches. If you start trying to second guess the DM, what were we supposed to do? You may end up going in circles. It's okay if you get confused or frustrated to just ignore something, move on. Not all mysteries can be solved and not everything the DM says is a clue. Also, D&D is about your character's story, so feel free to have some ambition. I mean, not the first time you play, but as you play and you learn about the world, feel free to aspire to something. When you meet Flight Captain Myriad of the Hawk Lords sitting atop his giant falcon resplendent in his feathered armor, you can decide, I want to be one of those dudes. If you meet two rangers in the forest and discover they're part of a secret society called the Coursers, you could decide you want to join them. Your DM will tell you how hard it is to give you some clues who to talk to or where to look. These things don't happen automatically. 
If you meet the Regent of Bedegar and think he's a Wangrod, you can decide you want to overthrow him. If you come back from the dungeon with heaps of gold, you could decide you want to build a keep or open an inn, all perfectly reasonable and part of a long tradition. It's your character and the DM put this world in front of you on purpose so you would interact with it. Feel free to aspire to things, to have some ambition. You could research a new spell or found an order of knights or build a keep and become a lord. It may take months of play to achieve, but it will be awesome. Respect the other players. If you find yourself saying, hey, relax, it's just a game, you are experiencing a misalignment of goals. You thought D&D was just hanging out and eating pizza and being ridiculous, but the other players wanted to make progress. They wanted to get further in the adventure, complete a quest, level up. You've read The Lord of the Rings, they're trying to get to Rivendell so they can meet Elrond and get their magic items identified, and you're just screwing around. D&D is a lot of fun, but for one player, the Dungeon Master, it's a colossal amount of work. And work they do outside the game before it even started, and work while running the game. Running all the bad guys, having to constantly be on in performance mode, is exhausting in a way playing D&D is not. So try to take the fictional world seriously. Try to take the other players and their characters seriously. Try to take your own character seriously. You can be funny, just like there are funny characters in fiction. You can screw around some of the time, there is time for that. But be mindful of the other players. There will be a time when the screwing around has to stop so you can play. On your turn. Part of the whole respecting the other players thing is knowing how your stuff works. The annoying player does the following. Okay, it's your turn, me the player. What does your character do? I cast sleep. Okay, sleep spell. Do you have that memorized? Yes. Okay, what does sleep do? I have no idea. It's just written here on my character sheet. Oh, I want to kill me, the player. When combat starts, the game becomes a lot less open-ended. It's like taking turns in any other game. When it's not your turn, think about what you're going to do when it is your turn. It's okay if, when your turn comes, you're not exactly sure what you want to do. That's fine. Maybe you were just really interested in what was happening up until that point. But do not tell the DM the action you're taking, what spell you're using or what weapon you're using, until after you've looked it up and read what it does. Your DM does not know every spell in the book. They don't have all the weapons memorized. It's your job to know how your stuff works. It's fine to say, I'm gonna cast sleep. Let me look it up and see what it does. That's fine. Maybe your DM knows what it does. Just don't declare your action and then sit there waiting as though it's up to the DM to do everything else. It is not. It's up to you to know how your stuff works. Also, just get in the habit of reading through this in your spare time. It's not a book you can really read from cover to cover. It's a reference book, not a novel. But these are the rules to the game. Get to know them. Get a copy of the book and put it in the bathroom. I think the toilet is the best player academy in the world. You'll learn a lot just reading this thing while you, uh perform your ablutions. Lastly, it's just a hobby and a very weird one at that. It's okay to try it and then say, thanks, but it's not for me. Don't feel bad. I, I don't feel bad that I don't like model trains or bowling. Actually, I used to like bowling quite a lot. I probably still would. You get the point. It's not for everyone. But, and this is important, be aware that it's possible that you bounced off D&D because the people you were playing with were wangrods. You know, I use that word a lot, but it's unfair. A group doesn't have to be filled with wangrods to be unfun. It could just be their style is wildly different from yours. That's the lesson here. There are as many ways to play D&D as there are people playing it. No two games are the same. Each of my campaigns has been very different from the others, and I'm just one guy. So consider if it doesn't work out, if your DM's world or game isn't to your taste, or you and the other players aren't simpatico, that it might just have been a failure of the moment, and that someone else's game might be to your fancy. Finally, finally, that someone else might be you. There's this terrible fallacy, this false dichotomy in D&D that we're all divided into players and DMs. But I think that's nonsense. When I started in the 1980s, almost everyone took their turn behind the screen. And some of us turned out to be better suited to it. Okay. But everyone who tries D&D should at least try dungeon mastering. It's sort of your responsibility. Because your DM does a stupid amount of work. They need a break, and when that happens, you should think about running. I get questions on Twitter from people who are asking how to talk to their DM because the game they're in isn't that fun. I always tell them what I'm about to tell you. You are the DM your group needs. It's okay if this all seems weird, it will eventually all be second nature. Relax. Somehow it all turns out okay. Strangely enough, it all turns out well. How? Oh. I don't know. It's a mystery. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. If you want to help support the channel, I am an independent fantasy author. The best way to support the channel is come by my Amazon page. There's a link in the doobly-doo. I write hard-boiled fantasy. I have two books out. They each cost four bucks, of which I get three bucks. If you buy both of them, you're throwing me six bucks. Next week, we go back to DM advice. Maybe we'll cover uh, terrain and pick up on the Getting on the Grid series, but I don't know. You let me know what you'd like to see. I really hope that if a friend of yours invited you to play D&D, you give it a try. Say yes. Until next time, peace. Out.